This week on Political Capital from Iowa, the long buildup is almost over. Voters start to weigh in Tuesday. Our guest is one of the front runners in the Iowa caucuses, Republican Congressman Ron Paul. And on the last word, famed pollster Ann Selzer sets the stage. Kate and Margaret explain the stakes. We begin the program in Sioux Center, Iowa, and our guest is one of the front runners in the Iowa caucuses, Republican Ron Paul, a Texas congressman. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. You are in the crosshairs. John Huntsman, the union leader, are attacking you in New Hampshire. Michelle Bachman and Rick Santorum are assailing what they call your dangerous foreign <laughs> policy uh, in Iowa. Is all this taking a toll? Well, I don't think so, because, you know, I'm, I talk about this and I say, you know, I'm a strict constitutionalist, I want to balance the budget, I want to cut spending, I don't want to go to war unless we declare the wars, I want to protect civil liberties, and I figure, what's dangerous about that? <laughs> you know, that, that seems strange that that's dangerous to obey the Constitution and always vote against big spending and big government. Sounds like conservatives should agree with me. You're actually taking a couple of days off this weekend, which is almost never done before the Iowa caucuses. You've said you're doing well in Iowa. Everybody accepts that. Candidly, do you expect to win on Tuesday? You know, I really don't know. What do you think? Um, well, I, I'm going to come in, I think, first or second, but, you, you know, I just don't ever make those kind of bold predictions, right. say, oh, I'm going to win, I'm going to win, because I really don't know. But if, if I did come in fifth or sixth, you know, that would be a real shocker. Well, <laughs> so we're, I'm going to do well, but to, to predict, uh, I, I just don't know. Okay, if you should come in first. All Republican candidates are for cutting spending, they're for reducing taxes, they're for eliminating Obamacare. What message would a Paul victory send? Well, that I'm serious, because right. they haven't proposed any cuts. Any, nobody in Washington, Republicans or Democrats, or the other candidates, there's no serious cuts. There's, they're only talking about token cuts on proposed increases, you know, 10 years out, because they all accept baseline budgeting. I want actually cuts. I want to cut a trillion dollars. So you think dollars. the message would be that the, the others are too tepid? Well, that, they, that the people saw through it, that, right. they were, that, that they were part of the status quo, and they didn't offer anything differently. The foreign policy would be the same, the Federal Reserve policy would be the same, spending policies would be the same, deficits don't matter, it would be all the same thing. And that's true of the other, other six candidates, right? Oh, I think so. I don't yeah. see any actual cuts. You, one of your rivals, Newt Gingrich, uh, in criticizing you, said your views were offensive to every, quote, decent, end quote, American. He couldn't support you if you were the nominee. Could you support him if he were the nominee? Oh, I, I'd probably have have trouble uh, because uh, I've sort of been asked that question, and I would say I'd have to see how they how the candidate comes around to accepting these views. If if the policies of the Republican Party are same as the Democrat Party, and they don't want to change anything on foreign policy, they don't want to cut anything, they don't want to audit the Fed and find out about monetary policy, they don't want to have actual, you know, change in government, that is a problem but for you. You'd have trouble supporting Gingrich. Does it offend you when he says that the decent Americans? Are... Well, you know, I guess after you've been in this business for a while, you know, you don't have time to be offended. Of course, nobody likes it, you know. Yeah. People, people you, you know, you have have a, you, you have a conscience. People don't like to be attacked, but to, to be offended and upset, you, you just sort of shrug it off and say it's politics as usual. Congressman, you have consistently said that you have no intention or interest in a third party or independent candidacy. Is there anything that could happen in the months ahead that could conceivably cause you to at least rethink that? No, not really. You know, I've never been an absolutist and say absolutely right. might or absolute will. But I have no intention of doing. But I can't imagine it. But if they, if the party ignored you and didn't nominate you, would that, uh, and didn't pay attention to your views? Uh, right now, I would say that uh, it doesn't. I don't think about it because, just like you pointed out, we're doing pretty well in the polls. You said a minute ago that you would have trouble supporting Newt Gingrich. You've also criticized some of your other opponents, including Mr. Gingrich, Michelle Bachman, Rick Santorum, Rick Perry. But in researching this, you've almost never criticized your co-leader in Iowa, Mitt Romney. Why? Well, some of the ads have, you know. Mm. We've, we've, but not we've, like the, we not call, like Gingrich. You know, we've accused him of this vicious term that he flip-flops. <laughs> you know, so so we we have we have done that. It's not as bad as being a serial hypocrite. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could call him a serial flip-flopper then. <laughs> Do you find Mitt Romney less objectionable than some of the others, or no difference? 
I think he has a decorum that's different. He's a little bit more diplomatic, I think, in, in the way he handles things. I, I don't think he has, um, y you know, convictions that, you know, come close to, to mine, but I think, I think he probably understands how the market works as a businessman a little bit better than a guy like Gingrich does, right. you know, and the people who have never been in business. So, uh, but, but I see him, I put them all in the same category. They're, they're all a part of the status quo. But you said you would have trouble supporting Gingrich. Could the same thing be said of Romney? I, I think so. I, I've said that about all the candidates. I'd want to know what evolves and what kind of platform they have and whether by that time they're willing to say, yes, it is time to come right. home, from, home from Afghanistan. Matter of fact, Mitt said that one time in our first debate and I wondered, I thought, well, boy, he sounds like maybe, right. maybe he should bring troops home. But then again, I think he decided, well, you have to be more hawkish in the Republican primary, so he doesn't talk that way again. So I'd wait and see. Let me ask you a couple of questions about the controversies uh, regarding some of the bigoted rantings and newsletters, which you explained was others that you didn't, that you don't associate with. But you did author a book one time that said that people who are sexually harassed in the workplace ought to simply quit their jobs. Do you believe there should be no legal recourse for people who are sexually harassed? Well. Uh, Maybe, but people, that, that's, a, that's a vague, vague thing, sexual harassment. That right. means there's abuse. I think it's, uh, it shows, um, you know, real bad behavior. I'm not sure if I was working in a place and people were ridiculing me and they were, that was the boss, I don't think I'd want to work there. Uh, so but I don't see, I don't think there's any place for the average person who feels that they have been, uh, a, a, a bad joke was told in front of them and they were embarrassed and their feelings were hurt, that it's a federal offense, that you have a federal okay. law dealing with this. I think political correctness is, is something that uh, has gone, gone wild. I mean, it's out of control. Let me ask you one more. You are not a bigot. I think most anyone who knows you will, will say that. But what upsets some people is that while you disassociate yourself from the anti-Semitic and the racial hate, there's no sense of outrage or revulsion. Are you outraged by some of those things people said? Yeah, but I take it in the context, I'm outraged by so many things. I'm outraged by some of our foreign policy, but I also have to take it into context. What I can't change, I can't do much about. Right. You know, you have to sort of understand that. So I'm outraged by an awfully lot. I'm outraged by our economic system, which is sticking it to the middle class and bailing out the width. Right. I'm outraged with our foreign policy that is destroying lives and undermining our, our national defense. So there's a lot of things that I'm outraged about but and I want to do something about it and that's why I talk about monetary policy but but things you know personality wise and character assassinations yeah I'm annoyed with it I don't like it but uh, all I can do is you know civil liberties I'm the best civil libertarian ever run running in recent years because I'm condemning the uh, the the unfairness of the enforcement speaking of our of, drug laws speaking and of liberties kind of we have to get you to your Sioux Center <laughs> yeah. town hall congressman thank you so much for being with us and when we come back we'll talk to Bloomberg reporters on the trail in Iowa. Welcome back. Bloomberg News political reporters John McCormick and Lisa Lair have been crisscrossing Iowa with the candidates. They join us now from the big city outside the Polk County Convention Center in Des Moines while I'm out here with the real people. Lisa, let's start with you. You've been with Mitt Romney for a while. He really thinks he's going to win this baby next Tuesday, doesn't he? Yeah, well, he certainly thinks he's going to either win or come in second to Ron Paul, which many of his camp would count as a win, since they don't see Paul as a viable candidate for getting the nomination and going through the whole process. Romney, of course, has been very reluctant to say, you know, make any predictions about what's going to happen next Tuesday. But you can tell from his upbeat attitude and from uh, the positive comments his staff is, are, are making out on the trail that they feel really good. Well, they also are going to spend a lot more time in Iowa than they had they had originally told us they were going to spend. Uh, do, you know, describe him as a candidate now. Is there any difference? You've seen him now for months. Uh, does that upbeat uh, attitude reflect him on the, uh, you know, reflect itself on the on the trail? Well, he certainly seems more confident, and he's really one really notable difference from earlier in the year is be he's become begun begun talking a lot more about his past and his family life. 
He talks a lot about traveling the country with his parents and seeing the sights of America. Um, that's, you know, in part an effort to humanize him to voters so voters get to know him. But they're also looking towards the general election and they really want to drive home a very patriotic message and sort of cast subtly, cast doubt on whether. Uh, how, whether the president really understands the concerns of Americans and the nature of the country. Well, I would say he got almost 30,000 votes last time. He's got to do better than that this time, I would suggest. But John McCormick, you, no one has watched Iowa more than you have, or very few have. 119,000 Republicans turned out last time. This time, there's supposed to be more energy in the party, no Democratic uh, caucus. Should we look for a turnout closer to the 250,000 the Democrats got in 2008? I don't think it'll be quite that high, but that is a huge unknown in this in this race as we head into Tuesday. Uh, turnout is going to be critical in terms of uh, you know how many people actually turn out. A low turnout theoretically helps Ron Paul because his his supporters are so committed to him they'll watch you know over hot coals for him to come to the caucuses. A high turnout might be pretty good for Mitt Romney if more sort of mainstream uh, Republicans turn out and and some independent voters even that could be very good for Romney. So that's something we just don't know. The polls can't pick that up in terms of predicting what the turnout is going to be. Let me ask you about the so-called social three. Uh, Rick Santorum, Rick Perry, and Michelle Bachman all stressing uh, conservative social issues these final days. Uh, if one of them breaks out, they could be, they could finish in the top two or three. Yeah, I think, you know, every, the conventional wisdom is that, that Santorum has the best chance of doing that right now. and. Uh, you know, he's moving up in the polls. He seems to be peaking at just the right time. The saying here in Iowa is organize, 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 and then get hot at the end. He's been organizing all year, and he seems to be getting hot at the end here. So things look good for him. The question is, you know, if three tickets come out of Iowa, as they traditionally do, first, second, and third, um, if Santorum was able to get that third spot, does he have enough money to go forward in New Hampshire, South Carolina, Florida, these other contests that are going to follow very quickly after Iowa? Lisa, what happened to Michelle Bachman? She was, she was in August. She could do nothing wrong. Why? It just seems to have faded. Why did she lose that magic? Well, frankly, she's competing with two other candidates for a very big portion of the electorate here, social conservatives. But there's a lot of can a lot of competition. Uh, Rick Santorum is also making a play for that group, as is, of course, Rick Perry. And she just hasn't. There's. She's also had some organizational issues this week. One of her main supporters left her camp to go stand behind Paul, and that's raised questions for a lot of voters about whether she really has the organizational ability to go through this whole process. Lisa, one gets the impression that Newt Gingrich also is in a free fall. Uh, is, is that true, do you think, and why? Well, it's certainly what's been indicated in the polls. He has sunk a little bit. In part, I think that's because the sheer number of attack ads he's weathered in the state over the past couple of weeks. Uh, millions and millions have been spent attacking him questioning whether he's a true conservative, bringing up all these things from his background that, frankly, uh, his can campaign doesn't want to talk about. And that's really hurt him. And he hasn't had the funding or the organization to strike back effectively. Lisa, you mentioned earlier that uh, Ron Paul, a Ron Paul victory in Iowa wouldn't be bad news at all for the Romney people. And I get the impression in talking to him that they really don't worry about Newt Gingrich in the long run, that the one candidate they would like to not do well in Iowa would be Rick Perry, even though they think, you know, he's had all sorts of problems and he's vulnerable. He's the one person who might be able to go the distance with him. Is that is that a fair reading? Well, in part, that's because Perry is. I think that is a fair reading. In part, it's because Perry has an awful lot of money. He um, he and he has very strong organization. So he they are worried about his campaign a little bit, but he they haven't seen signs that his candidacy can really uh, make much progress. Mm -hmm. Uh, John, let's go to Ron Paul, who was our guest earlier. Uh, there are those that say that if Ron Paul wins the Iowa caucuses, which he may well do, uh, that it would be bad for the Iowa caucuses. It would show that it's not all that important. Uh, what's your take on that? Well, it's. Uh, uh, I, I, I think Ron Paul has spent a lot of time in the state. He's organized the state. He was here four years ago, of course. So. I don't think anybody can say, you know, Iowa doesn't matter. If, if you do come here and spend time, you can do well in Iowa, generally, although Michelle Bachman certainly has spent a lot of time here. Um, but it, I think the Iowa, there's just sort of this uh, momentum for the Iowa caucuses. It's a tradition that just sort of seems to, you know, every four years we think it's going to be the last time that this will be a big deal, but it never seems to go away. 
The one thing I think that has threatened the caucuses and probably will continue to do is sort of the, uh, the, the technology. These candidates spent very little time in Iowa compared to four years ago. Um, the, the debates played a big role and social media and advertising played a big role. But the, the, the days that many of these top candidates, including Romney, spent on the ground here was really very, very minimal. Well, John, and one so person, if one person get a sense that they really don't have to spend that much time in Iowa to still do well here. That may take away sort of some of the uh, the magic that Iowa's been able to maintain. Okay, listen, you both have done a terrific job, and we'll over the next three or four days. And when we return, we'll talk to Kate and Margaret and the legendary Iowa pollster Ann Selzer. Ron Paul is certainly bringing in first-time coffee. Welcome back. We'll go to Kate and Margaret in just a moment. But first, the Globes pollster, Ann Seltzer of Des Moines, Iowa, the pollster for Bloomberg and the Des Moines Regi Register. So you do cover the Globe. I Ann, do. tell us on this cold, snowy night next Tuesday, except it's 47 degrees and sunny, uh, and 1,774 precincts. Who's going to turn out and vote? Who are the Iowans who are supposed to vote in this? Well, one of the things that makes the Iowa caucuses so quirky and really kind of fun is that it's unpredictable. Right. Anybody can show up on caucus night. If they're not registered, they can register that night. They can change their registration. That means people who are registered Democrats and independents today. So when CNN has a poll up. talking about just registered Republicans, that doesn't reflect Democrats or independents who might show up to vote for Paul or Romney or anybody else next day. That's right. Right. Uh, do we ha last time there was this massive Democratic turnout. You sort of caught the wave. Very few people did. Uh, is there a sense now that with the Republicans being the only game in town, with the anti-Obama feeling and the GOP rank, that there may be a similar surge? In well, it's hard to know exactly how many people are going to show up, but Ron Paul is certainly bringing in first-time caucus goers, so that's new bodies coming in. Right. So if there is a big turnout, I mean, likely that's credit to Ron Paul. And there were 119,000 Republicans who voted last time, one key number. Second key number, Mitt Romney got almost 30,000. Uh, he ought to certainly in this field better that this time. I won't get you to comment on that. <laughs> what issues matter out here? We hear a lot about the social conservatives, the evangelicals. Is that the dominant issue among, in the GOP ranks? That was certainly the dominant issue four years ago, but the world has changed. Right. And every poll we've done asking about issues this time around, the economy, jobs, the economy, jobs, tax reform. It's a fiscal year for conservatives. The social issues matter to a small group. We'll see just how small. Um, but they're really much less of a concern right now. Well, that was certainly reflected in the poll you did for Bloomberg yes. uh, of Iowa uh, um, uh, voters. Um, why is it then that Michelle Bachman and Rick Perry and Rick Santorum are, are actually stressing only social issues in the closing week. Well, I think one reason is they got into this race thinking they could be the next Mike Huckabee, that right. they could win they Iowa because time. of those social issues, and he won last time. And he got a pretty good life, even if he didn't get the nomination. Right. So I think they're stressing it because they know that there's a narrow block of people. They want to get as many of that block as they right. can. Finally, Barack Obama carried Iowa rather handily in 2008. What kind of shape is he in today? You know, the, anecdotally, I can only tell you is that you hear a lot of disaffected Obama supporters. I don't hear a lot of defection. Uh, we'll find out he's not yet begun to campaign. Um, our last poll in February showed him a little bit doing a little bit better in Iowa than the national average. I think he still has a good base here. And we should point out that Iowa uh, on, on the economy is doing better than the national uh, average, too. It is, and it's likely to be a battleground, Al. Stay here, and I want to turn to Margaret and Kate now. Kate, let me go to you first. Let's talk about who has to do what on Tuesday. Mitt Romney. What does Mitt Romney have to do uh, next Tuesday in the Iowa caucuses? Well, Al, I think Mitt Romney looks like he's in a pretty strong position. The polls tell us he's tied for first place with Ron Paul. I think a Ron Paul win hurts Iowa more than it hurts Mitt Romney. I think what Mitt Romney has to do is continue to benefit from the fact that for the past year, there has not been a consensus conservative candidate who's a viable alternative to him. Okay, Margaret, what do you think Mitt Romney has to do? Well, Romney's like Richie Rich, uh, spent all that money only to help, say, Rick Santorum have a bump, but not uh, Mitt Romney. He probably doesn't surpass what's been his ceiling of 25%. Uh, if the others in the race were to all combine, they could beat him, but they won't. I think he's got to get at least the number of votes he got last time. This is a weaker field. He's got to get at least 30,000 votes or people are going to say it was somewhat disappointing. How about Newt Gingrich? He was, the, he was the flavor du jour just a week or two ago, Margaret. What does he have to do in Iowa to still be hot, credible? Well, from 32 to 14, he's got so much room. He's fallen faster than the New Year's Eve ball at Times Square. 
I don't see how he gets back to anything like he was in the time he has to do it. Cato Byrne, Newt has to finish first, second, or third. Given the uh, given his poll standing uh, and his fortunes over the past couple of weeks, I agree with Margaret. I don't see how he regains any altitude unless he would have beat Mitt Romney in Iowa. Right. And Kate, how about maybe that? not even then, Al? <laughs> How about the social conservative three that Ann talked about a moment ago? Yeah, Rick Perry and Michelle Bachman and Rick Santorum. Uh, do, can, can you set any benchmarks for them, what they have to achieve on Tuesday to come out of this with credibility? Yeah, I think so. Uh, it does appear, Al, that the Santorum surge we predicted has happened. You predicted. Uh, yeah. Rick Santorum would need to finish uh, really in the top three really strongly. And then I think he'd have to head to South Carolina and maybe knock off a bank on the way and try to come up with a few million dollars. <laughs> How about Rick Perry? Anything he can do to, to regain the credibility that he lost for those debates, Margaret? He, he can be confused in any setting, and mm -hmm. he's pandered to the right on his dropping rape and incest from his exceptions to abortion. You know, I think there's a three- to four-way tie. Uh, Bachman is plummeting like Nick, Newt Gingrich. Uh, I see Santorum coming in uh, third and being the, the, the Christian right candidate that, that comes out of Iowa as a okay. winner.